Let me start uh, today by thanking, uh, uh, boy, this is going to take me some reading, uh, Rajazakar, Rajazakar A and Karen O. Uh, uh, Karen, for your monthly, thank you very much. And uh, this is a repeated uh, generous donation from, uh, from uh, Rajazakar. So thank you, uh, both of you, very much. And... Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I hope you continue getting all the fun out of this that I'm getting out of making it. Uh, so today's um, conversation is uh, one that a bunch of you, I think, have been trying to uh, get me to do something with. And I mean, this probability or possibility of actually learning to, to paint without a teacher, without somebody hands-on, without somebody next to you, uh, it, it's probably preposterous. But I don't see any reason t- for me to not talk about some of these points and let you do what you can. I'm, I, <laughs> you know, I think you could describe me as being credulous. <laughs> I think some people say that's believing the unbelievable. But um, I'd have to say, well, I don't believe, I've never seen evidence to suggest that you can pick this up just simply on your own. Uh, I would have to say we have a, uh, we have a, uh, Besides a cold day in New England, when my nose is running, we have a uh, uh, sort of new world, and uh, in some places, an immobile world that gives possibilities without necessarily probabilities. The possibilities are there because you can actually have this conversation. You can talk. You can talk back to me. You can t- listen to me. You can uh, send images to me and um, and to others, and be online about all this stuff. It forever will be a question to me, uh, at least. <laughs> So far has been uh, whether I can actually communicate an adequate level of what even what I have to say, never mind what the whole content of this is, without the experiential hand of a, of a, of a coach, you know, nearby. So I suppose you could say it's like having somebody coach you by watching a video of you play basketball. There's probably some things a guy can say, but nowhere near the effect if he can get you to do it, for example, right there on the spot. That's only one of so many other things. So... Uh, let me um, let me bring up the question and uh, see if we can uh, work this out. I'm going to try, for the sake of those guys um, who have asked me before, not to be quite so um, not to be quite so fast in my speech. To go ahead and be slower because of beginners, um, <clears throat> and I'm sorry because of people who don't or aren't, or aren't uh, native English speakers. <laughs> And for some who are, I have to admit, sometimes I really have a hard time understanding certain Englishmen, those guys from from um, from Great Britain or even Australia, where who speak who we th- we think speak the same language, or Ireland. I've, t- <laughs> I've run into more dialects. Yeah, but even in this country, if you speak fast, you can't understand. For example, if you're from the north, you'd have a lot of trouble understanding a person from the south if they if they're fast speakers. So I get that. John says, could you describe what stages of training you would suggest a beginning impressionist work through? Hey, I like beginning impressionist. I like that mind. <laughs> I mean, first of all, everybody should be an impressionist, meaning, meaning you have to learn to master the visual impression. That's your first job. If you can't master the visual impression, you don't know your stuff. You don't know the world. You don't know nature. You don't know the world you're actually um, evolving from or drawing forth your, your, your juices from, you know, your, your, your gold. So... Um, I like that, though, the beginning impressionist. And then, uh, so what stages they should work through uh, as they progress towards capturing the visual truth in full color without trying to bite off too much too fast? You know, there's an organic aspect to this. So I can't tell you there's what some little stage here and a little stage there. I've never been able to buy into the idea that we do this little exercise. That'll get you the first thing. The second exercise will get you the second thing. The third will get you the third thing. I've never been able to buy that. I've not had that experience in my life. What I have had is the experience of almost like kids playing the ball game out, you know, to learn baseball when I was a kid at five or six years old. I learned it by playing, guys screaming at me, no, no, don't run that way, you know, or whatever, hurry up and get to the base. Oh, you're out, what does out mean, you know? <laughs> it's all been done in the process, you know, and I appreciated that about Gamble. You know, everything he did was um, in the process. And now I say that, that doesn't mean there are no exercises, but mostly everything he did was in the process of teaching you to make a picture. So it's all the stuff of making a picture, which is what his bailiwick was, and really what, what is it's the game, right? So you're really trying to teach some of the game, and then there are elements in the game 
But um, yeah, the question of can you back them out? You know, I find that most people you want to do exercises. If you want to do exercises, which you, some people think of as stages of development or stages of what stages, you know. But if you want to do that, you should break those out for yourself. When you see that you're weak in getting proportions, for example, you should create exercises for yourself. Uh, draw from life with the idea of finding better ways to look at relationships to get you the proportions. Which ones do deliver the proportions and then work and work and work them until you get good at it. So, but yeah. Uh, but stages, yeah, as I said, it's organic. So some things will pick up for you, you'll pick up something about proportions where somebody else is getting something about values that you never even thought about yet. And it's just interesting how differently people do work and think. And it's hard to to load. I find it difficult to load people up. But so I'm going to just give it to you and just the, it, one more time, I guess you could say, the way it was handed to me, just give you the sort of background that I have that got me where I am. And maybe I can break off some pieces of it for you uh, that make, may make you think, well, well, that may be a stage or something. Um, thinking primarily of beginners who are trying to learn the craft as well as seeing the visual truth as efficiently and effectively as possible, but are not able to study directly under a master. Well, the craft thing, you know, you can talk a conversation. Um, the one thing you have if you're anywhere near a museum is you have the ability to go look at pictures, um, a huge number of which are done very competently uh, with high levels of craftsmanship. Uh, and uh, craftsmanship now means um, pictures that, that don't crack up over time, pictures that uh, have, have, a, have, have a nice surface where, where the uh, paint quality is good and consistent and, uh, you know, that doesn't look like somebody's floundering. You know, there's the unity of the, of the craft, unity of the paint uh, treatment, things like that. You can pick those up probably best looking at pictures and working. You always have to have your working going on, but then go look at pictures. But you won't get that looking at anything I send you or anything um, uh, uh, online, you, you, you won't do it, in my humble opinion, of course. So that's the craft side of this thing. Now, some parts of the craft are washing your brushes, you know, keeping your brushes clean at the end of the day, washing them, uh, and how to do that and all that sort of craft, you know, as well as seeing the, uh, you know, as well as stretching a canvas so it doesn't, uh, so it doesn't collapse on you. Um, getting good canvases, using good canvases. Uh, so, um, yeah, but that's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff there, you know. So the beginner, you know, I'm not going to even recommend you do any of those. The craft, the, the, the stretching canvas things, I'd recommend you just use uh, various boards that are available, preferably for a beginner with tooth. Um, sort of a standard... Um, you know, the sort of 9 by 12s 11 by 14s probably be the biggest you'd get uh, when it comes to painting. Um, but, but, it's, but, this, but I'm going to focus on the visual truth, uh, which is not, which is really something that may be slightly, whew, I hate to say it's more communicable, but it might be, I don't know, let's look at it. I have a bunch of other questions from uh, John too, and um, so... And this is where really you break it out. So, um, I mean, specific points. Um, so what makes a first a good first subject? I'm just going to take this in the order in which you've offered it to me, and I'll feed in stuff as we go. But um, what makes a good first subject? Well, um, for some reason, I wrote the word three up there. I meant to eliminate that. Um, if you, if you're, if you, a still life is a good first subject, right? Uh, painting outdoors isn't. Um, painting, drawing a cast is a good first subject, you know, or any object, preferably not just a simple, a simplistic one, preferably a couple together, but two or three things together, a dark, a middle tone, a light thing, three different sizes, ideally three different complexities of shape and those sorts of things. So they're fun to, they'll set each other off. And then, and then the idea of putting them in a grouping, not side by side, putting, make, create a little combination with them so that they make a fascinating abstraction and, uh, and varieties of silhouettes and that against each other and that sort of thing. That's a good first subject. Keep it simple. I quote Ang sometimes, uh, who said, give me three things and I'll give you a still life. And I'm sure he meant, I'll give you a good still life. <laughs> three objects. Um, so uh, that's the first one. But start with a cast uh, when it comes to drawing. Uh, 
I think what I maybe want to do, um, and now you remember you're talking about as an impressionist, you say impressionist, and you think I mean with you uh, a, a painter, a painter, somebody working in color, and I'll get to that. But the first part of impressionism is drawing. Uh, for everybody, it's the same thing. And the first part of drawing is actually shape making. And the most important part of shape making for a while is, uh, and I say shape, and we, you all know what I mean by shape. I mean, I mean that outline, <laughs> that thing that we call, you know, the, like the contour of objects. Whatever makes a shape, um, a dark spot against a light ground, or a light spot against a dark ground in this case, uh, will make a shape. That's all we mean by just a two-dimensional phenomenon in space, you know, where, and shape is every place. But shape has two components that Ang wouldn't even let you into his studio if you hadn't some mastery of, and that is proportion and gesture. That is, that is the angle aspect of shape and the uh, proportions. So I, call, I refer to those two things, and then I call some, the other part the bump count, which is just, just so the proportion of this to this, right? Say, say the length of this distance here to some other distances, the great length of this to the width of this, those sorts of things. Those, remember, they're all, everything I'm going to tell you is proportional. And um, so if you understand, though, that every, every, unit of, every unit of shape, like a finger, this has a particular angle to it. This is a different angle. This one is almost horizontal. This one's not. And the various angles you see are what I'm talking about when I say gesture. Those are the angles of units of, of shape. And, uh, and any blob has it unless it's perfectly round. They have a tendency, right, to be slightly longer one way than they'll have a tilt. Like my hand, I would guess, has a tilt this way, right? And so each of the fingers has their own tilt. That's what I mean by angle. And the width to the length is what I mean by proportion. Or the length to the length is what I mean by proportion. Any, so the total length and how big this is in relation to that or how big this length is in relation to this length. I'm hoping you can see my hand. You can't see my hand, can you? Or can you? I guess you can. I gotta learn to keep it up here higher. It was a difficulty. I actually started this video and realized you weren't, my hands weren't in the picture. So um, hopefully I have it now. I think I do. I think I was showing that in a good place. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so um, now, so that's, but so let's go look at that just for a second. What I what I actually let's look at a picture, and I'm just showing you some stuff. And this is the, my recommendation to you. Uh, first of all, that you draw something like an object. It could be a cast or it could be something else. Don't 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 treat yourself like a simple-minded person. In fact, the most difficult thing to draw is something simple. And and for that reason alone, I wouldn't have you draw something simple. <laughs> draw something more complex. Now you could say, well, that looks more difficult to me. But yes, in a certain way it is. In another way, it's just not. You know. Uh, I remember, uh, if I haven't told you already, this story about the um, uh, the uh, equestrian um, master, whose whose one of his students brought her girlfriend with her to, and asked him if he would show off a little bit and show her some of his mastery and that sort of thing. And he says to her, "You don't want to see me. You want to see my great student out there. You see him, the guy out there doing running the barrels. Just watch him. Look at him. He's you know he's he's jumping uh, fences and." and uh, water bodies and whatever else. Look at the stuff he's doing. And uh, so they watched a little bit, and then finally they turned to the master and said, well, we really wanted to see you. And, he's, and, and he said, well, okay. And he walked his horse a step forward and a step back. And, but that's what we're talking about, the simplicity that, of that. The mastery in a th simple thing like that, it's, <laughs> it's a, you can't even begin to address half the questions anyway, but, but uh, they're all there. But um, so simple subjects, no, just pick a cast. So I'm showing you um, some, I think the two on the left are student things. But what, what we typically do is set up a cast, uh, probably a little better than this is the silhouetting side isn't strong enough. I prefer to set up a cast so it has a decent silhouette all the way around so that we can say, well, can you do that? Can you just draw that shape? That's what we mean by shape, obviously. Everybody would understand that. So can you first draw that shape? And then I have a student do a little linear exercise. Uh, and so one of my, you know, lacking a teacher, you know, the one of the things you might do is shoot those two side by side. By the way, we do set them up so they're side by side. At least uh, this is now that side size thing. But what's going to happen if you set them up side by side is you're going to start trying to transfer this measurement over to here. And you're going to start transferring this measurement over to here. So I recommend what a student do is just pick a top and bottom and and make the widths right to the top and bottom. 
right? As you go around, make the width right to the top and bottom. The top and bottom never change, okay? And at some point in the drawing, push it back so, you can, so that it appears to be the same height. And you'll be able to have nature itself in a side-by-side -side correct you. And at that point, by the way, you can then take a photograph, which might gain you a little objectivity. Remember the biggest problem in drawing, even for an impressionist, is to get to see the world as if it were flat, right? Because you're actually tr interpreting, Gamble, Degas saying that uh, drawing is interpretation of form. You're interpreting the uh, third dimension on onto a flat, you're, you're drawing forth on a flat surface, the third dimension that exists in the real world. But it starts with just learning to re reduce the world to flat, to reduce the world to already a drawing. And if you can do that and see the world, stop trying to see in and understand what really is and just try to see what appears. Then you'll understand what I mean by a width to a height. It's not his width. It's not his height. It's just a height that we choose, bottom of this, top of that. And then the width, something over here, something over here. And are they right to that? And as you go along, you'll see, you'll see to correct those. And if you can just find the mentality of just get around a bit and then follow the back straggler. As soon as you see something's off, correct it. And, and don't add more stuff if you can easily correct the stuff you already have. Follow simple models like that. But I know this already sounds like it's not stages. Well, this is stages in the sense that outline really is the... And if Degas is right, that um, silhouette is everything. It's all silhouette. Then you understand that what we're trying to get you to learn to do. Even in Impressionist work, the silhouette is a hugely important thing, the ability to articulate a, a, pat, a shape, that is to say, and get the proportions and the angle and all that stuff right, as well as the what I'm calling the bump count. Um, so what I then have people do is I have them simply mass in the major values, f studying the line of shadow, literally demarking the line of shadow, which is the point beyond which no light gets. So in this moment, we suddenly become like those guys who are teaching the science of light on an object, right? And the exercise you're doing is like that. And you'd do well to do two or three of these things and don't take 10 days on them. Try to do them in, in a handful of days. But be accurate and be, don't be kidding yourself about how inaccurate you are. Make the outline as like as you can and make the shadow line as like as you can and have a look at it while well, it's just a line. And I do recommend you get the charcoal paper and the sharp vine charcoal and all that stuff. But just ask me for that. I'll send you my primer. It gives you all those instructions. In any case, what you're trying to do is get the great value of this to this to this to this, right? Just the great, what you call the great masses, the great flat masses. And treat them flat for a while. I know this one does have the beginning of turning, but that's probably where I was trying to show somebody what happens after that. So that begins to be, if you want to call it stages, that would be a stage one would be, can you do shape? You know, and this is Ang saying, draw lines, my son, to the God, lots of lines from memory and from life, memory and from nature, yeah. And uh, so that would be the outline. And then there's this whole, this is now shape. Now you're in the world of pure abstract shape, this light thing. Now you're not saying the head anymore, which you might have been saying, I'm drawing the outline of the object. Well, you have to get over that now. And you can say I'm drawing the outline of the shape of the darks of the shadow unit. But in the case of this thing here, it's a combination of this value here turning into this. Or you could even argue that this dark here goes up and around and becomes this whole thing is one big shape. And you want to get good at drawing shape. And shape is really the beginning of, of the abstractions of the visual world, the two-dimensional pattern of a, <clears throat> created by dark on a light or light on the dark and so on. So if you want to talk about stages, get good at that. I know you want to start painting, but <laughs> get good at that. And by the way, you can do, sometimes you can do this in paint. If you get this, you find this tedious. This was under Gamel that I did this. This photograph is crooked. It wasn't quite that far off in my gesture. Um, but the, um, but the, uh, but then working up, learning, learning to study up areas and doing the middle tones and all that sort of thing and getting the great form of the, of the head moving from light to dark and getting the big effect of light and all those sorts of things. That's all yours to play with. Uh, if you can get the major values here, you'll feel the light on this cast, right? You'll feel the light, and you'll try to keep that light as you work the subtle nuances of form. Now, you can't study up form too much. Form is, form, which is value transition work. Value transitions produce form ideas, produce forms, and you have to be on, in touch with the idea, for example, this, what is this form here doing? Form means the rounding. That's what we mean by literally the, 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 the modulation that creates roundness. Not the modulation that is the, uh, like a cast shadow. That's different, but uh, we think of that as transitions or gradations. But they're all gradations. This is just one of them, this cast shadow on a wall or a uh, transition from light to dark on a wall as you're getting further from the light. 
or even the uh, transitions of say this is a shadow here even the transitions from here being middle tone to being lighter and then darker you know and then going back out again to, back to lighter again these are all transition tones right so you want to get good at those things by the way uh, Jocko this begins to get you that list of things you have the 15 things that I still haven't put together I'm sorry about that I will do you pay attention you'll probably see me covering that for example one of the things you have to be able to do is get your major masses right and value to each other but uh, the ability to make shape with all of the gesture associated with it and the bump counts and the distance between each bump group you know getting all the angles between these little things as well as the gestural angle of the whole these are all things that you got to get good at so there's plenty to do right here guys you don't have to run off and become a and become a, a broken color uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, atmosphere painter or something like that. Um, you do have to learn to make shadows flat. So in an area, a mass has actually got virtually no form in it. You have to learn how to put it down as if it had no form. Learn how to really manage a surface area so it appears formless, like it doesn't have busynesses in it. It's just flat as, as heck. And you, at that point, once you get to the certain point, you can put your finger into that or whatever uh, massing tool you have and really even that up, flatten it up and adjust the values making it flatter as you go these are just the thoughts we go through so i know i'm overdoing this but i but this is really where everything i say i'm overdoing it i mean i'm taking longer on this video not to you i'm overdoing it but to me i <laughs> i'm taking longer on this video than i than i would need to but that gets you let's just go back up and look at your question again so would you always start a student with oil paint or pastel or even watercolor and the answer of course is that i wouldn't start with any i would start with charcoal and um <clears throat> Uh, yeah, these other ones are generic questions, but I'm doing this. This is all stages discussion. So I'll just go through the whole list of photographs and I'll come back and read those questions again and talk about the underlying concepts that you talk about, uh, John. So um, I want to talk about the cast, though, because this is the, the beginning. This is, this is like a, a Chardin still life. And this is like for all the things we're talking about. This is Reynolds talking, saying anybody who can paint a still life can paint anything. The complexity of an entire painting is in a still life. So if you can get three or four objects together that make entertaining silhouettes and, uh, and, 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 you know, have fun forms and color relations and that sort of thing and get them, and get them placed well in a frame, uh, you're, you're well on your way. And if you can do that in, in drawing only, uh, I mean, if, if, you've, if you think you must color it, you'd be wrong, is what I mean to say. You really want to be able to do that in, in um, values only. So... Uh, but but the idea the, that um, the still life the still life holds still it's the most important thing about the still life and it gives you a chance actually to organize stuff so what I tried to do here uh, in an early phase with Gamble and you've seen this all before but this is the idea is to create an interesting spot in the you know this what we call a center of interest so I have the cupid that has some element of the human and has all this but I also have I have this horn and all these combinations of the the bowl and all these things happening in one place, creating a busy action. You can see there's some action out here, busy stuff out here, and, and minor, less busy, and some busynesses of sorts. But this is the power center, and to be able to learn to do that, that's something. That's, that's just set up stuff, and and don't set up. Don't take two weeks to set it up. Set up three or four things. Find a ground to set them in front of. Uh, do try to get the things that belong together in color. And then, and then as you're doing these still life setups, try to find things that have a nice range of value variety. Um, you can see that what I did here, I have a dark background, basically. I have a bunch of middle tone stuff plowing through here and in the background, and I have whites. So you can see I have, and I have these come up as three different whites, so there's variety even in those. And then you can see that some, see that some objects are simpler, less simple, and then getting more and more complex as you take an area at least, but there's a whole variety of different kinds of objects. Cloth can be made more complex or less complex. Uh, leaves are tended to be, this is a compote with a double bubble sort of uh, uh, shape down here. Um, so, um, but after you've done all those things, uh, and by the way, that again, that story with this is that all I did here was the same old process. I used the outline into mass process that I'd use. This is strictly sort of obeying the gamma model, you know, drawing outlines and modeling masses. And, uh, and, and this is a, because it's a lay-in, we're not after every little tiny form. You don't see features on the kid's face and all the details, the fineness of the, but it's enough to actually, for me to see clearly that I have 
because we were going to trace from these things to make a painting, which you could also do if you wanted to. Not, I know what you're thinking to yourself is, how's this going to get to me to be an impressionist? Well, it gets you to actually have to go through processes of making shapes better and making complex shapes better, making gesture of total packages. Like this, this whole life thing is itself one unit. And for you to get the gesture of that unit is a big skill. So I think you can follow that I'm, that I'm, what I'm getting at when I say that. Um, I can't believe we're already 20 minutes into this thing. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, I guess this is going to be the course, I guess, right? So, um, But what I do then with students is I try to get them, this is now Impressionism here, okay? So in the course of the intensive workshops, I have people work in black and white. And if you can look at these things, uh, I see that I can move this in for you. I'm hoping that works out for my uh, for my guy. But this this is a, you can see this is a sort of a still life and stuff, some other stuff. But you can see that these are a whole series. This is an interior. Uh, this is a copy. This is a copy from, uh, and that's one of the things you can do in copying, by the way. These are copies of guys that I give examples of the starts by Boston School Painters. Again, I'll send you any of that stuff when you, as you need it, when you want it, whatever. But um, I wanted to show you, so here's a, uh, so here's an interior. See, this is a back of an easel. And so this person is just taking a section of a room. And that's the kind of stuff I recommend you do. And then just blur your eyes and try to draw in the visual order. Try to draw the top readers and nothing but the top readers. And end with one of these things that's completely there. All the values are there. All the major value masses are there. But just the drawing that reads at the high end. And maybe some slightly lower level drawing than that. And uh, that's, these things should serve as a decent example of what I try to get people to do. This is on brown paper. And then you work with the darks and the lights and pure values right from the beginning. Use pure values. Use the actual values you see. So those are the recommendations uh, of the, uh, for, the, um, for the next phase if you, if we're, when, you're still talking about, um, when you're still talking about how to become an impressionist. This would, if I call this a stage, that's fine with me. But it's a stage of understanding where you can... Um, and by the way, these lines around here, uh, I ask people to look through viewfinders now at this point. So you're actually, your picture is now through the viewfinder. And so um, I'm asking people to look through a viewfinder and find a composition that they think is in balance, which takes some serious work. And you wouldn't, you're way better off having done this first and, um, and then framed it, you know, done a nice drawing, and then framed it, try, making the frame wider and taller and finding the, just the right framing proportions. And uh, scale, scale is the, how big this the uh, center of interest is in relation to the frame. But how high it is, how low it is, uh, whether it's a vertical picture versus a horizontal, how square versus how long, and then of course the up, how high, how low, how left, how right. The left and rightness placement of the center is all about equilibrium. So all these are stages you go through, and if you just practice these all the time, you can't draw, by the way, too much, and you just draw as many different things as you can find. You stay with simple objects for a while, and but get them in really decent light with good contrasts and all those sorts of things, and then then mix a couple and two or three and get make complex ones and learn to work from now. I'm talking about learn to work from a frame, so to speak, from a viewfinder, looking through it as a, from a viewfinder. I wouldn't do that in the first ones if you're following what I was saying about the way Gamble had us work. He would just, if we're saying it the way he worked, I would say we'd, he would have us draw this woman here, which you probably can't make out as a woman, but it's from the start that I've shown you. And, uh, and then he eventually, after he'd drawn all this background stuff, he would then eventually rather crop, crop this the way he wanted it, find the frame size and the, and the scale to the frame and all that sort of thing. So, but when it gets to uh, color, the other thing I have students do is just go hit notes. Uh, I wanted to ask, I should have done, I didn't get that far. I forgot completely to ask one of my students, who I'm pretty sure has taken shots of his progress of his, in a still life with me and, um, and to use his mark making. But his mark making in a still life is actually similar to this, where he's just searching for color. And this is the rec my recommendation to you is that you, you work from outside in. This is the opposite of working from lines. This is now working from spots and blobs. And it works any which way. You just have to be very patient and put the blobs of color in about their right place and make yourself a student of color relations. And remembering that, of course, color relations is, is value relations. And if you did your previous work with values, you would have the values in hand. And when you went out there to, to draw something, you'd say, what's my darkest dark and my lightest light and all those sorts of things would be in your hand already mentally. 
if you've done that previous stage where you can see that's what people are doing here. They're setting up their darkest darks. I'm looking for one that's not completely inky, like this one here. You can see the darkest dark is up here and the lightest light is here and all the other values are doing what they're supposed to be doing in relation. You'll learn to do that. Be a master of value relations. If you are that, then when you're working color, you'll always be saying, well, what's the value of that color? Because the value is the most important part of the color. If you don't get the value, you won't get the color right. And then, and then practice the process of, of, of comparing the the dark the value to the value within the within the frame just as spots so put a darker red down here put a lighter one up here let them sit there and put even this one over there and let these reds sit out there and while you watch and look at them and and see if your set of three does the same thing i'm just looking at the reds if yours does the same thing as theirs or the set of the greens this dark one and the darkest one and then these other ones and and then you can compare so compare them by value then you can compare them by intensity What's the most intense of all my greens? You can see that the, more, the most intense green is probably this one right here. The most intense red is this. And you adjust them to intensity, by intensity. And uh, so you do value, you do intensity, and then you're also doing red, yellow, and blueness. So this is a bluer green. And this is what you're doing, just putting notes out there. This is a pure explorative, you know, a purely exploratory process. Really, everything we do is, right? Even the way we draw outlines, you said, Paxton talks about floating lines. We float the top, we float the bottom, we begin to look for a side place that'll probably have the painting in the right place. Again, I, I ask you to go ahead and ask me for my um, primer on drawing and I can, some of those things are explained. But, um, uh, but spotting these colors around and getting them right to each other without thinking about drawing and then gradually, you know, you'll pull off something, you'll say, Finally, you have these blues out here doing the right thing to all the other, like the other lights. This will be relating to this one. You'll have that value right. You'll have the color difference right, the red, the hue difference. So by the way, you do have a, what shall we say, a blue and a yellow and a red. Let's be crude about it, okay? And you'll have all these relationships to each other, and you'll be thinking, you'll be trying to project them so that you can say, that feels like it's going to give me this effect, this, this light effect. Uh, or this, or this, uh, and this is again the whole issue is: Can you watch the thing as a whole and see how, even though you're putting spots to each other, to each other, to each other, are you watching the whole to see if they're going to come together as that unity that you see in front of you? So you have to have a preconceived. You look at it until you think you think you have an idea what it is as a unity. Try to get that. Always work at getting that idea in your mind even before you start the grand unity of the whole thing, or the big impression, what we call the big impression. And because uh, that's what you're really trying to set up. And so at some point, you'll, you'll notice that the strongest reader maybe is here or it might, there might be some other odd places where it is, but in terms of strength, there'll be something like this or this. And some of these guys begin to be the touchstone of the setup too. You find this value and this value, you say, you'll bring them together and that'll be the beginning of your drawing. You slowly bring the drawing together and you get to test these two colors against each other. And at that point, you're comparing value contrast to value contrast to value contrast, right? And you'll have these players you're going to be setting out there. But that's going to be just take your sweet time and keep keep working around and adjusting things you just totally overlooked. And you're gradually trying to fill the canvas and slowly coming at the drawing through the back door. That's the alternative model, the one that you really want to get to know. Uh, if you really want to have both ends of this game, because you want to be able to go both ways and you need to frequently, right? So in our world, really, we do out, we go out there, we set out the color note. And by the way, you see that in Sargent as well. He sets out the color note and then you find him bringing them together to the drawing. That's a quote from some one of these guys who watched the video, watched the, uh, who watched the um, um, demonstrations. So, and I'm just giving you some other examples that are sort of, this, these are Metcalf, by the way, that one and, the, and these two. And you can see that, and that is clearly what he does. And there's some that are much more obviously leaving lots of the canvas still sitting there. Some of his paintings look like their canvases are in a sort of a gray maybe direction. I've never found that to be useful or to be necessary, but sometimes, I mean, it doesn't hurt anything if you chose to do that. Just don't make it, make it something so near white. You can call it gray. Or, or, and some people prefer to warm it up. I mean, the ones, but I just don't know whether that's actually what he did if he just, if, or if the color coincidentally on the canvas was like that. But I have found, at one point, I found an old canvas that, uh, or the canvas that had been stretched was, a, um, was less than white and less brilliant than white. I don't want to have arguments about what that's for and stuff or discussions about that or wasting your time now. But I'm also sending you over to the Monet model uh, as, as the um, sort of the predecessor for all this way of working in the purely visual way, which is when you say impressionist, 
what we're thinking. And this guy, you can see that this is a disciplined effort to hit color notes and compare and compare and compare. So this orange moves over here, gets less orange, and by the time it gets up here, it's a, or I should say your reds, so we call these reds. But you start with a rather an orange, and you get closer to being pinky if you do your comparisons well. And it's not, he's not making this stuff up. And then you get back here to the cooler reds, and these things, you begin to learn to see things in sets of more than one, and, and those are behaviors. Those are things that you do. And you can do nothing to get here but just do this. There's no, there's no tricks, there's no devices, and sight size won't help you. It's not the right thing, so comparing side by side. What you have to learn to do is preconceive the whole and put notes out there and say, for example, let my darkest dark be this. And you're gonna have to learn the hard way, shall we say, and let my lightest light be this and put a note down that. By the way, when you make whites, make sure they have a color. By the way, when you make darks, make sure they have a color too, which will keep you from some of the inkinesses that you tend toward. But, uh, but you'll say, you'll set out these notes and then you'll start setting out all the other ones that land between them in value. And you'll be searching for your most intense notes and all this stuff is just a grand search all over the whole place, watching and watching all these things as blobs just to see if they'll come together and see and, and watch them come together and bring them, bring them into relation to each other. Don't get impatient and start th mudding up and, and coloring in big fat swatches trying to cover the canvas. Just be patient with like this guy is. Canvas will cover itself. And uh, so, and I think that's all I have on this one. So I'm going to go back up and talk talk about the points he had, where he's specific about asking something. So what should be the measure of success for the first session? Is it better to continually fail at a subject too complex, or are there ways to simplify in such a way even a beginner can walking away, walk away counting a session as a success? This conversation is a marathon conversation. Not only is painting, like you know, art. Art is long. Life is short, right? But every painting, you think marathon. You don't think happy little things. On the other hand, I'm gonna assure you that I personally need to have success all along the way. And you don't know how to measure that yet, right? But if you say to yourself, where's the top and bottom of this painting going to be? And you see that you're tempted to move the top up or the bottom down, you can count yourself successful when you didn't do that. You maintained your top and bottom of, of your mark, you know, marks. But those are measures of success, right? But the first session, that would be one, right? Um, or the measure of success is if you're supposed to be floating lines around, spotting some lines like top and bottom, and beginning to get more lines to begin to see, and, and I'm sorry about floating them without connecting them. If you can begin to see how the layout of the land is going to be, then that's a big deal. That's a, that's a stage of evolution. Can you do that and respect it, learn to do it? And then as you go through the process, uh, uh, every time you do a proportion um, say a linear proportion with your eyes, and you should always draw your linear proportions with your eyes. I mean to say, you should look at this and see if you can get it that the right to this length. Always do that. And then you can take a ruler and you can put one inch here and see how many and a half it comes to down here. You can hold that up in front of you, just in front of you and see if it matches your painting. And that way you're, you're checking yourself, right? So each time you get a reward that says, look, you got that right, that's going to be one of those things. But remember, you're training a painter here. You're not training. <laughs> you can't say, you know, in any particular picture, you're going to feel more frustration than you are going to feel satisfaction because it's such a long process and it's tedious. So I just remember thinking at some point when I was a kid trying to figure out how to dribble a basketball so I could play basketball successfully. Uh, that I just figured I'd never learned it. After practice and practice and practice, I figured I'd never learned it. And one day I was just doing it. But there's this element of that, that how do you think of that as satisfying? You just keep bouncing the stupid thing off your leg or running into something or falling or something because you're not watching where you go, oh, whatever silly thing it is for a kid, you know? So you, you got to be careful that you don't measure so much. Make your mentality about measuring is at the end of six months, line up on the wall all the things that you did and see if you can see progress, okay? And that'll be the best determiner. But yeah, um, the only reward is if you get some feedback. I mean, the big reward if you get feedback from a teacher. Now, if your teacher is always only saying, you're still off here and you're still off there. I had to get that from Gamble. I had to say, oh, he didn't say I was off here. And that was the big problem I had. So that was my back struggle before, and now it's this. So that was one of those things I could get, uh, you know, what you, what you would call the reverse feedback or something. But you do, that's where a fresh eye is really helpful. Or as I said, if you can, um, shoot it with a camera side by side and they're set up in such a way that they appear to be the same size. You can shoot it side by side and see if, how it feels from time to time. You might feel some sense of progress. Um, but yeah, 
Is it better to continually fail at a subject too complex? Um, no, it, it's not really. That's a different discussion. Um, it's not that you want to do simplistic things, but you want to do things simple enough so you can get through multiples, right? To God would always say, fix it in the next one. And you want to take that mentality that it's not about getting this really, really good thing. That's when everybody does this six months and nine months and a year on a picture, and, and they never learn to make pictures. They, they just learn to make one picture. And people will say, well, that's a good thing, right? If you learn to make one, you can make more and you can speed up. But the mentality turns out to be wrong when you start doing it that way. So you want to make one that's simple enough for you to get through and fail at. Yeah, I mean, and notice it's full of failings, but notice you also get to a point where you're just frustrated with it. You've run out of gas, remembering again that every painting has a, if you want to call it the, you know, the Energizer Bunny lifespan. You know, it only has so much and you get sick and tired of the painting. Well, um, and that's, that's ideal for us, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There may be no more meat in the bone, you know what I mean? So, and so I used to, used to set a standard for yourself of try to do, um, of try to, if you're painting, try to do it in no more than a month, do it in less. Um, and then get to the next one and don't let yourself, what'll happen is you get lazy and you start picking around, picking around. You can make an excuse, I'm picking at it, you know. I wouldn't make that excuse. I would just say, give yourself a limited amount of time and, and try to execute in a limited amount of time. You can make it less, you can make it two weeks. If it's a simple enough subject, you'll already have screwed it up so bad in two weeks. But, um, and there are things I can recommend to you, that is to say, when you are drawing, doing some drawing and you, and you look at the drawing and, it's, and you see that it's not very good, learn how to say, when well, what's the backstraggler? And to give the backstraggler a name so you can actually then get success and satisfaction. When you say, oh, oh, the widths are off, and the, particularly this one right here, and then get a new concept of how that width feels to, 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 to the length, and, and then proceed to try to get it. Put it down, try to get it. And then again, look and see if you did. Go back and debrief and look and see if you actually got it. And so what'll happen is you'll be doubtful about it because you don't have anybody standing there. And some things are much more difficult to measure like width to length rather than linears. But you'll, you'll sort of prove this in the linears because you can check it with a measurement that way. And by the way, just talk about linear measurements. Um, there are measurements that we, we tend to think of top and bottom and measurements horizontally. But when a thing is gesturing, like my hand is here, then the length would be something that's at a tilt. And the linears are the sizes of things going this way at this tilt. So don't feel stuck to measuring things in a vertical and horizontal. Don't be, don't be locked in like that. Linear measurements can be had along a line that tilts, okay? And they're important, every, every, every set of those, because they're measurable. And that was, and really, if you can do linears, you're in a hugely in the right direction to get to, to, to really being better at something that's more difficult, which is width to height, or, or width to length, I really should say, because height really isn't the issue. So, um, but yeah, don't take, a, don't take on a big complex subject because you won't get through enough of them. And um, yes, there is a simplification, but that's what you're going to learn to do anyway over time. You're going to learn to blur your eyes and draw the majors, and that's why I sort of encourage you to do this in the values world, so you're not drawing every dang little thing you see there, but you're learning to place the top players, learning to isolate them by blurring your eyes. You say, all right, which guys are the guys that set this painting up, right? So we really do work from a constellation, what we call the arabesque. We work from the set of points that make this, this say, six, seven, five-sided figure. We learn to set up these points in relation to each other and get angles right, those sorts of things. This is Sargent again, points and angles. Now you can get better at that. You can get better at points and angles, but you gotta be disciplined. You gotta say, what's the God of all angles? That's vertical, right? So every angle has to be right to vertical, has to be seen as a concept in relation to vertical. And then all the angles have to be right to each other. Those are things that are teachable and will give you satisfaction. That's a self-teachable. Um, I'll stop at that question, but if a student keeps fall, uh, failing at capturing color relationships from life, would I have them fall back to master copies? Uh, and no, I actually wouldn't. And, um, but again, you know, the camera is, uh, has some limited value. If you can shoot a side by side of something in color, you'll have some feedback, but you won't have, it won't be good enough really because even the values coming through a camera are different from those that you're going to be seeing with your eye. The camera does things to adjust them and stuff. But now you, you, you can see color, you can learn color from masters. That is to say colorism, you know, color relation. You know, that's a, you can see this beautiful thing. And if you copy a few beautiful things from nature, 
if you if you copy them accurately, that is say, if you copy them with a view to trying to understand the guy's color beauty, then you might pick up some of the some of their hints about what makes for beauty and color. But we're talking about color relationships in life, and um, and the most important thing is for you to do what I'm talking about, as I said before in the beginning of this. So, I. I um, I would do the Munzel thing, by the way, and his other point, last point, was some other exercises that produce color charts, or like producing color charts. Yeah, I would go ahead and do that if it wakes you up to the idea of of, of, of values landing between zero, shall we say, white and and ten black, and being able to 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 modulate values in a way that you where you see the step progression of those things. Those are useful, even to use the Munzel color mixing uh, ideas. I've never found it a great thing from the point of view to stay floating around in theory real long. But every once in a while, there's a, there's a good exercise like that because the Munzo in particular has its, um, has its uh, uh, base in how, how, how oil paints work. Oh, you asked that question before. Would you start a student with oil? Gamel started me with pastel, and you uh, should... Uh, Consider whatever you have in hand uh, should be fine for you. Uh, pastel is probably more like drawing; it's just a point making a mark. In the sense of color work, though, it's actually more difficult because there's a com- you may not have the right stick for the thing, so it forces you into a complex world, which you could easily argue might be the one you want to be in if you're an impressionist, right? So you have to make every color out of three different colors. So in that sense, it might even be good. But um, so I don't have a plan that way. If a person prefers pastel, we do pastel. And uh, oil paint is fine, and I'm, I, I, I'm very comfortable with both of them for me and a student. So, I think I better stop at that. Um, I've given you a, some sort of a beginning bunch of discussion points, and if you want to narrow it down, or if others of you want to narrow it down, we can maybe create this as a series that relates to the beginner, and maybe you can force me to create a, um, as it were, a, um, a lesson plan by doing this, or, 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 or a construct for beginners to think about. So. You, I don't know if it's you, Kofi. I can't remember who else it was out there. Several people have asked me about um, how to learn from me long distance and uh, um, take advantage if there's something I can do further. But this has been a long one, uh, 50 minutes. And maybe you'll like that. I don't know. The first version I did was 35 minutes. I thought that was hysterically long. All right. Uh, did I thank our guys, the donors, for this? Yes, I did. Okay, got to keep remembering to do that. And thank you all for your sharing, for your uh, subscribing, for liking everything that you do. And I especially like the comments. And I'm a big fan of of, of craft comments. I say, what? How can I help? Uh, I mean, I don't mind you. I like it when people say nice things to me about that. It's help something's helping them and stuff. But if there's something comes to mind that you think I can address that you've heard of and you haven't got a clue precisely what it means. Uh, and want to know what my thought is about it. Those kinds of things are good. And that's not, I'm not so much interested, in, as I said, about talking about other painters, but talking about aspects of our field, the way you're hearing it from me right now. I think you'll find uh, uh, that you can, as you go along, as you think this way, you may draw, questions will draw forth for themselves. Have a piece of paper next to you. You know, it's like when you're taking, if you want to remember your dreams, you've got to have a piece of paper next to the bed. And you'll start remembering your dreams, I found. But... Um, it's the same thing with this. If you're working and you don't have a piece of paper that, that you're planning to put a note down to ask Paul something, or it wouldn't have to be me to be even think about for yourself, uh, that piece of paper will actually help you to be to have that piece in your mind that might be helpful. Okay, so good luck, beginners. I may have made it way too complex. I'm hoping that you can get a little something out of this, uh, John. And uh, I wish well on all your efforts. Anyway, enjoy your, enjoy your week and um, see you, I should say, your next few days. I'll see you then.